This is the new 2019 Ford Ranger, and it revives the Ranger name that existed for decades and finally went away after the 2011 model year. But now, with renewed interest in small trucks, the Ford Ranger is back. And today, I'm going to find out if it's any good. Before I dive into this, a little background on the Ranger. Now, for many years, the Ranger was Ford's other pickup, sort of a smaller alternative to the larger F-150. And it was never an especially nice vehicle, but it was an honest, simple, reliable work truck. Unfortunately, about 10 years ago, the small pickup truck market segment was thought to be dead here in the United States, so Ford canceled the Ranger here in North America. But now, they've brought it back. But this is not a new truck. Even though the 2019 Ford Ranger is new to North America, this is roughly the same vehicle that Ford has been selling in other countries for the last several years. In fact, living here in San Diego, I've already seen a bunch of these new Rangers on the road because Ford has been offering roughly this same model in Mexico for a while now. Still, the 2019 Ranger has been adapted and modernized a little bit for its reintroduction into the American market, and probably its most notable feature is the powertrain. North American Rangers will only come with a 2.3 liter turbocharged four cylinder that makes 270 horsepower and 310 pound feet of torque. Pretty healthy. That's mated to a 10 speed automatic transmission. This truck is offered with rear or four wheel drive, obviously. This one is an extended cab model with rear wheel drive. So, with that out of the way, now it's time for me to show you all the quirks and features of the new Ranger. Then I'm going to get it out on the road and drive it, and then I'm going to give it a Doug score. And for more of my thoughts on the Ranger, click the link below to visit autotrader.com slash oversteer, where I've also rounded up a list of the highest mileage used pickups currently listed for sale on Autotrader. I'm going to start the quirks and features on the inside of the new Ranger, and specifically with the button to fold in the power mirrors. It's not just a switch where you go fold or unfold. It's this button, and the mirrors instantly respond to whatever you do, which means you can make them do a little dance if you just keep pushing it. Take a look. Our next interesting item in this truck is the sheer amount of safety equipment that it features. Now, this is a Lariat model, which is pretty high up in the range, but it's not full of crazy, opulent, luxury stuff. And yet, this thing has Lane Keep Assist, which is this feature that will steer you back into your lane if you start to veer out. It has adaptive cruise control, so it'll slow down or speed up on the highway based on the speed of the car in front of you, which is a feature that only a few years ago seemed only possible in BMWs, Mercedes, Lexuses, and now it's trickled down to sort of a mid-level compact pickup truck. It is just incredible to me how far safety technology has expanded. Next up, we move on to the center console. Open it up and you will find this little plastic tray near the latch, which is of course for pens, a nice easy spot to keep them. But if you look on the underside of the lid of the center console, you will also see a little clip for one single pen and a little diagram of a pen so you know what to keep there. You'll never run out of pens if you have a Ranger. Next up, check this out. This is something I like to call the Ford Hierarchy of Sounds. Okay, so I have the hazard lights on and you can hear them clicking like turn signals, but you open the door and then... Yes, that's right, Ford temporarily mutes the hazard light sound so that you can hear its door opening chime. Apparently, Ford thinks that the door opener is more important than the hazard light sound, at least briefly, because then the hazard light sound comes back on. But it's kind of interesting to think about car engineering. You have to figure out which sounds take priority over others and which ones deserve to be muted, something I hadn't really considered before. And next up, to the left of the steering wheel, you'll see a little button over there with a pickup on it and like a light shining into the bed. You press that button to turn on the bed lights, so if you have stuff in there and you're trying to find your work tools and it's late at night, you can turn on the bed lights and you'll have your area illuminated so things will be a little easier to find. Next we move on to the back of the new Ranger where there are a couple of interesting features. One is the fact that the giant Ford logo in the back 
isn't merely a Ford logo. Look closer, look underneath, and you will see it also hides the backup camera, which is a pretty clever spot to stick that in. Most people will never notice that it's there, and it means you don't have to put some extra little contraption in the back to hold the backup camera. Something else I like about the back of the Ranger, I love the fact that they actually spell out Ranger on the tailgate, like those old 1990s Toyota pickups that spelled out Toyota. Most automakers have gone away from that, but it gives it sort of a tough truck kind of image from the old days, and I think it looks really cool. One labeling item that I'm not so sure about is on the brake lights. If you get really close on the bottom half of the brake lights, you can see it says Blind Spot Radar which is fine, but why do they have to tell you that's where it is? When you look at the turn signal, it doesn't say turn signal. So why did they decide to label that one piece? Is it so you could brag to people that you have a blind spot monitoring system in your truck? <laughs> and another interesting item printed on the outside of this truck at the base of the windshield, it says Ranger, and it also has a little image of the front of the truck. I suspect they're doing this to follow Chrysler's lead. A few years ago, Chrysler started printing cool little graphics on its windshields, and what they found was that with those little graphics, people were far likelier to replace their windshield with a factory windshield if it got damaged than going to an aftermarket part. So maybe now other automakers will start to follow suit, and this is an example of that. Now next I want to talk about the Raptor. There's a new Ford pickup out, and so naturally one of the first questions that people ask, especially enthusiasts, is, is there going to be a Raptor? And Ford surprised everybody by saying no, they have no plans to develop a Raptor version of this truck like they have for the F-150. I was really surprised by that, and it leads me to think that one of three things may be going on. Number one is the fact that this Ranger is already pretty far along in its life cycle. This truck came out in 2011, 2012 for the rest of the world, and so it's probably only got maybe three or four years left before it is redesigned. Even though it's a new truck in North America, it isn't globally. So I'm thinking maybe Ford doesn't see the point in developing a Raptor, and then redesigning the truck and then developing another one and they're just going to wait. That's possibility number one. Number two is that they're straight up lying to us. If they tell you they're going to build a Raptor, then you'll wait to buy one. Or if they say, no, we're not thinking about a Raptor, you go buy one, then they come out with a Raptor and you buy another, which is a tried and true car company strategy. Could be. Of course, there's also a third possibility, and that would be that Ford is simply stupid. Okay, you take a look at the truck market. The trucks that sell the very fastest with the smallest discounts are the off-road version of the F-150, the Raptor, and the off-road version of the Toyota Tacoma, which is called the TRD Pro. They sell immediately, they're selling for over sticker price, they're really popular, dealers love them. So Ford looks at that market and they're like, well, the F-150's off-road version sells well, and the Tacoma's off-road version sells well, so we're not gonna make an off-road version for the Ranger. I sincerely hope a Raptor version is coming, either on this generation or the next generation Ranger, because to not make one could only be described as stupid, given the success of those types of vehicles with other models, and given the brand equity and name recognition that the Raptor already has after Ford has spent so much time and money developing it. But moving back to the back of the Ranger, now when you drop the tailgate in a new F-150, it has this cool step system where you can pull out a series of steps and step right into your bed and there's even a railing. Unfortunately, the Ranger is an older truck than the latest F-150, even though it's just coming out in the States. It's been out in foreign markets for a few years now, so they didn't develop any sort of easy entry system into the bed for the Ranger. But anyway, because there was no easy bed entry system, you gotta get in the old-fashioned way. <laughs> I made it. That only took six tries. Now next we move on to getting into the back seat of the new Ranger. And I suspect most Ranger owners who actually want to use their back seat are going to get the crew cab model. This is only the extended cab, but still it's worth checking out. To get into the back, you open the front door, then you open the rear door, which swings this way. Now the front seat is currently positioned where a normal person would sit. So climbing into the back here with the front seat there is actually impossible for an adult. If you're gonna have somebody back here, you really need to move this front seat forward and then compromise front legroom a little bit in order to get someone in back. These rear seats in the extended cab model are really only for small kids or short trips. 
But once you're in the back seats, there are a couple of interesting quirks and features in this truck, one of which is the hidden compartments underneath the seat backs. Now, to get under the seat back, you pull this little fabric loop which releases the seat back, and then you have to open this little plastic container, and then you see the tire jack, which is over on this side in the back seat. Over on the passenger side in the back seat, you do the exact same thing, and then you'll find just a hidden storage compartment for whatever you want to keep back there. Now, a moment ago, I mentioned how restrictive the legroom was for these back seats, and that it's really only reserved for children or adults for very short periods of time. But believe it or not, the legroom isn't the thing that makes these back seats so uncomfortable. That would be the angle of the seat back. It is 90 degrees. So you have to sit completely upright in the back of this car, absolutely uncomfortable, and not how people actually sit in vehicles. Again, if you're gonna take any people in the back of your Ranger for any distances, go for the crew cab model because no one will want to sit back here. Now, interestingly, despite the lack of comfort with these back seats, Ford does provide rear seat passengers with two separate USB charge ports and with a household electrical outlet. So you could be making toast in your toaster while you're driven along in the backseat of your Ranger in utter discomfort. Now, next you move under the hood. There are a couple of interesting items, starting with the warning label for the fan. I love this because it just reads left to right without any words at all. First, there's an exclamation point. Watch out. Then there's a fan. Then you could get your hand stuck in the fan and then Read the owner's manual, please. It says so much without using any words at all. And if you look closely, you'll see that the little graphic of the hand on that warning label, it only has four fingers. So that person already had a little incident with a fan, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, moving on to the actual engine itself. 2.3 liter turbo four-cylinder EcoBoost is the only powertrain in the Ranger. There is no V6, at least not yet, and probably not at all. Now, this really surprised me when I first heard it, but then I heard the numbers, 270 horsepower, 310 pound-feet of torque. That's really strong, and you'll see how I feel about that on the driving portion in a minute. But for now, I wanna talk towing and fuel economy. Towing is obviously important because people use trucks to tow, and this truck with this powertrain is rated for up to 7,500 pounds, which is impressive because the top of the line Chevy Colorado with a V6 can only tow 7,000 pounds, and the Toyota Tacoma can only tow 6,800 pounds. In fact, this almost reaches the towing capacity of the diesel Chevy Colorado at 7,700 pounds. That's a really impressive towing capacity for a small truck, and especially for just a four cylinder. And then we move on to fuel economy. This is rated at 21 miles per gallon in the city, 26 miles per gallon on the highway, or 23 miles per gallon combined. That's with two wheel drive, four wheel drive is a little bit lower. That obviously is a fantastic rating. Again, just behind the diesel Chevy Colorado, but obviously that is far more expensive considering that this is the base engine in the base Ranger. It's really good fuel economy numbers for a compact or mid-sized pickup truck, and basically it seems like you get all the power, the torque, the towing capacity with none of the fuel economy hit, or at least that's how it seems on paper. Next, moving back inside the truck, I want to talk about some of the technology with the screens here, and I'm going to start with the gauge cluster. Now, the gauge cluster features a center speedometer and then screens on the left and on the right. The screen on the left is fairly simple. It shows various displays, your fuel readout, your engine temperature, your RPM gauge, and it allows you to change and configure various settings. The screen on the right is more your infotainment screen, and it allows you to switch between displays for the navigation system, for your in-car entertainment, like your music, and for your phone. Now, that may not be a very advanced setup for a luxury vehicle, but for a compact mid-size pickup truck, that is a pretty slick setup, having that center dial and then two very easily usable, configurable, visible screens on either side. Now, as you might imagine, there are also a few quirks to the screen, starting with the remote starter configurability. If you go in there, it'll allows you to choose how long the truck stays on after you turn on the remote starter. And one of the options is 15 minutes. So if you wanna turn on your truck with the remote starter and then just let it sit and sit and sit, you can have it sit for up to 15 minutes. Also another interesting quirk in the screen on the left is there's a feature that will tell you how many seat belts are currently buckled, which in theory is actually a pretty decent idea. You see, I buckle my seat belt and it goes from zero to one. And if you're a parent and you wanna see if your children are buckled in, that seems like a pretty smart thing to have, except getting to it is difficult. You have to go into vehicle, 
then settings, then you have to scroll down to seat belts, then click on it, and then it shows the display. Wouldn't it be easier to just turn around? <laughs> this truck only has four seats. This thing's not a limo. I can see if the belts are buckled in, but nonetheless, that's a feature this truck has. And next up, we move on to the infotainment screen. Now, I've covered Ford's latest sync system in a variety of different Ford models, including the new Mustang, and I'll link that review below. But there are a couple of interesting quirks I noticed. One is that you have the option to choose between four different backgrounds. And oh boy, are they enticing. You get boring, 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 and boring. Where's the option for like a beautiful meadow or a gorgeous mountain or puffy clouds? Not from Ford. They just give you varying shades of gray or blue. And here's another interesting one from the infotainment system. I'm driving along and all of a sudden a message pops up on the screen. And not just a message, but an urgent message that says that the interstate ahead has some hazardous driving conditions. And I get kind of nervous there for a second, but then I remembered, this is San Diego, it's 70 degrees, it's a Saturday, there's no traffic. And even as I drove through where it said would be hazardous, it was not hazardous at all. So I'm not exactly sure why it freaked out, but I guess we now know that Ford's sync system may be a little bit of an anxiety problem. And so those are the quirks and features of the new Ford Ranger. Now it's time to get it out on the road and drive it. All right, driving the new Ranger. So I've been driving around for a couple days and here's what I've learned, two things. Number one, performance is excellent. Acceleration, whoa, and we're going. Acceleration, okay, when I first saw that it was only gonna be a four cylinder, even though it's 270 horse, even though it's turbocharged, EcoBoost, whatever, I just assumed it was gonna be the wimpiest compact truck. Everybody else has a V6, I'm like, come on. But actually, the performance is fantastic. This feels faster than Tacoma, Colorado, any versions of them. Uh, this feels like the fastest compact mid-sized truck, whatever you want to call it, on the market. It's really, really impressive. Great mid-range power, great highway passing power, which is shocking to me for a four-cylinder, no matter how turbocharged and torquey it is. It is a great powertrain in this truck. It works fantastically. The other thing I learned about this truck is that everything other than the powertrain is fine. Not incredible, not bad. You know, the infotainment system, it all works well. Ford's latest sync. The interior is fine. Um, no one's ever gonna be like, oh, it's not luxurious enough. I mean, it's a, it's a compact mid-sized truck. You know, nobody cares about that. But it's also, it's just, it's not great, it's fine. Uh, steering and handling, fine. Um, ride quality, fine. Uh, it's a little rougher than I thought it would be, actually. Ultimately, it's otherwise just a fairly standard truck that truthfully feels like something that is in the middle of its life cycle. Um, the seats, upright seats in the back, the parking brakes, some of the controls and materials, they've made a good job of integrating a lot of the latest technology into this vehicle, but this doesn't feel like an, a class killer, except for that powertrain. But that's a big except for, because the powertrain is responsible for the fuel economy and most of the capabilities of this truck. And honestly, those numbers are fantastic. Combine that with the acceleration number and the acceleration feel and the feeling of torque. Uh, I mean, this is just an excellent truck. Nonetheless, it would still be difficult for me not to want to get a Tacoma because that just sort of seems like the gold standard. You know, it's known for its durability, its reliability. How durable is a 2.3 liter, 270 horsepower turbo engine really gonna be compared to like a low stress Toyota 3.5 V6? Yeah, sure, the Tacoma's technology isn't as modern as this one in terms of infotainment, and maybe it doesn't have as many safety features and it's not as fast, but like, it's the Tacoma, it's proven. Um, but if you don't plan to own the truck for a long time, and if like acceleration and capability matters to you, and it does to some small mid-sized truck owners, this is compelling and it's because of that powertrain. I just can't believe how well it accelerates, how quick it is, both from a stop and mid-range is just crazy. I mean, this thing totally takes the place of a V6. And I'm not one to say, oh yeah, turbos are fine. We don't need big cylinder counts. I like the instant feel of a, of a V6 in a vehicle like this or of a V8 in a larger vehicle. I like that stuff. But this is one of the few powertrains I've seen where you get in and you're like, yeah, I don't actually need those extra cylinders. It's totally fine. I'll take the fuel economy. Uh, 
they've done an excellent job with it. And so that's the 2019 Ford Ranger. This is an excellent truck and a fantastic entrant into the growing small or mid-sized truck segment that we all thought was dead 10 years ago. And now it's time to give the new Ranger a Doug score. Starting with the weekend categories and styling, the Ranger is fine, but only just fine. Certainly not as bold and exciting as the Colorado ZR2 or the Tacoma, probably because this truck had to work for all global markets, so Ford didn't want to take any risks. It gets a 5 out of 10. Acceleration, the Ranger does 0 to 60 in 6.9 seconds, which is shockingly quick for a base engine and for a four-cylinder. It gets a 2 out of 10. Handling is fine, exactly as expected for a truck, and it gets a 3 out of 10. Fun factor is only okay. It's quicker than expected, but otherwise not a huge standout, and it gets a 2 out of 10. Cool factor is decent. It's cool that the Ranger is back, but that notoriety will fade as we start seeing these everywhere, and it gets a 4 out of 10 for a total weekend score of 16 out of 50. Next up are the daily categories and features. This Ranger is surprisingly well equipped for a truck, but obviously that's for a truck. It's missing the craziest luxury car amenities, and it gets a 6 out of 10. Comfort is fine, a bit harsher than I was expecting, and it gets a 5 out of 10. Practicality is good, usually with this sort of fuel economy and capability it would get a higher score, but the tiny back seats knocks it down to a 6 out of 10. I think if I had tested a crew cab this would have been one point higher. Finally, there's value. The Ranger is a good value, but not a great one. The truck I drove is around $35,000, which is a lot for an extended cab two-wheel drive model, especially considering that an F-150 isn't that much more expensive. I'm giving it a 6 out of 10 for a total daily score of 44 out of 50, and I'm knocking the Chevy Colorado ZR2 diesel down a point because the Ranger is definitely a better value. With that in mind, the Doug score is 44 out of 100, and here's where it falls against other trucks. Although I've mostly tested large trucks, the Colorado ZR2 is a close competitor I've tested. The Ranger finishes a point behind the Colorado overall entirely because the Colorado had a better weekend score due to its off-road capabilities and its cool off-roader styling. I suspect a Ranger Raptor would easily overtake the Chevy. Something to consider, Ford. You have to get in the old-fashioned way. <laughs> you have to get in the old-fashioned way. <laughs> well, I'm in. <laughs> you have to get in the old-fashioned way. <laughs> you have to get in the old-fashioned way.